Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. So good to see everybody. Give you a moment to get connected. Happy Tuesday to everyone. Great to see you. We're really excited about today's conversation on the origins of speech disorders and Parkinson's disease. Um, before we get started and I introduce our speaker, I want to invite you all to open up your chat box and we welcome your questions. We're going to hold those until the end, um, but we will try to get to those as I'm sure you probably will have many questions. And also, if you want to give us a shout out and let us know where you're joining us from, we'd like to see where everyone is uh, living and, and connecting with us um, from. My name is Anissa Mitchell and I'm with PND Alliance and I'm excited to um, welcome our speaker, Cynthia Fox. She's a speech and language pathologist who is a world leader in the administration of LSVT loud speech treatment for Parkinson's. Uh, she's an expert on rehabilitation and neuroplasticity and the role of exercise in the improvement of function uh, consequent to neural injury and disease. She's going to be diving deep into the concept of speech disorders and Parkinson's. Um, I got a little view of her slides ahead of time. You're in for a treat because she really gives us some great insight. So I'm going to welcome uh, Cynthia and pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to PMD Alliance for inviting me and always providing such great programming and topics. And um, it's exciting to be here and with you all today. So just give me one moment to get my screen shared. I'll pull up my slides and then we will be ready to go. I'll just take a few little clicks here to get everything where I need it to be. And I need to move this taskbar there and swap. Okay, so those should be looking full screen for you. And if for some reason they're not, I'll let the team jump in and let me know. So today we are going to talk about the origin of speech disorders in Parkinson disease. And so what are some of the underlying symptoms and how does that affect speech and communication? Um, I am affiliated with LSVT Global. So you heard a nice little bio. I won't go through that at all. I do just wanna point out my disclosures here. I'm an employee of LSVT Global and I do receive lecture honorarium and have ownership interest in the company as I'm one of the co-founders. And LSVT Loud will be one of the treatments that I am speaking about as we go through the day. Let's see if I can get this little try to keep those boxes from popping up. So today's topic, first of all, we're going to define what is the speech disorder associated with Parkinson disease. Then I'm gonna explore the contribution of the motor system and motor symptoms to speech disorder, followed by some of the non-motor symptoms and how they can impact speech and communication. And then we'll close out the session by highlighting some elements of speech treatment that are required for successful outcome. I'll give you just a little bit on speech treatment, but next week on May the 25th, my colleague Elizabeth Peterson will be presenting an entire hour presentation on speech treatment for people with Parkinson's. So I'll give you a little bit today, but you have the opportunity to get a lot more information next week. So a, over 89% of people with Parkinson's disease worldwide will have changes in voice and speech. So it is a very common symptom that happens with Parkinson's disease. A little less common are changes with cognition, um, 20 to 43%. And of course, studies vary depending upon uh, the participants involved, how many years they've had Parkinson's disease. But I bring that up here because cognition obviously is very important for successful communication. The most common perceptual characteristics of changes in voice and speech. So the things that we hear as a listener are the voice gets soft. That's probably the most common thing, a soft voice. 
With that, you can get changes in voice quality. So the voice might be a little more breathy, a little hoarse. It can get monotone. So the inflection that is typical tends to flatten out and it gets a bit monotone. Imprecise articulation as well for some individuals also experience vocal tremor. Now, these changes can occur very early in people with Parkinson disease. In fact, some people have reported that the soft voice, hoarse voice, monotone were one of the first symptoms that they uh, experienced. And they may have gone to an actual ENT doctor, otolaryngologist, before they got to the neurologist trying to understand what the changes were about. And there's acoustic evidence of very early voice and speech changes. And so some researchers are looking at perhaps using changes in voice, vocal loudness, vocal variability as an early biomarker to help us diagnose Parkinson disease sooner than later. Now, does this matter? So my voice gets soft, does that matter? And absolutely, yes, it does. Even people who may be perceived as clinically asymptomatic for speech deficits can start to report some feelings of embarrassment, social stigma, or isolation due to speech concerns. Maybe not sure, maybe some days my voice is there, some days it's not, and it begins to get a little bit of a problem. Some people feel excluded from conversations because they talk and people don't hear or understand them, or they say something and it's not interpreted correctly, so they get an incorrect response, and that can be super frustrating. And as this one client of Dr. Uh, Ramick, my colleague, said once before treatment, if I have no voice, I have no life. So we know communication is just so essential to who we are and how we communicate with those around us. So as I mentioned, there are both motor and non-motor symptoms that underlie the speech deficits that can occur in Parkinson's. And we have to address both the motor and non-motor symptoms in order to have successful speech treatment. So when we look at key motor symptoms listed here on the left, the two we really focus on related to speech are bradykinesia, so slower movements, and hypokinesia, reduced amplitude or smaller movements. And we can think about how that might impact the speech mechanism. In terms of non-motor symptoms, ones that can affect communication are changes in cognition. The one I'm going to focus most on are impaired kinesthetic awareness. That's your perception of your own speech as you're talking. And then also things um, that affect emotion can affect communication. Um, any experience with some apathy or anxiety or depression. So let's dig in a little bit more and think about how the motor symptoms impact speech. So with Parkinson's, as you know, there can be this sort of general loss of motor energy and movements get very underscaled. We see that in the body with smaller writing, smaller stride length, but it can happen to the speech mechanism as well. So with that reduced sort of drive or motor energy, you may not be taking in as big of breath. You may not be closing your vocal folds all the way. You may not be opening your mouth as wide, moving your articulators, your jaw, your tongue, et cetera. And so what can come out are these perceptual characteristics again, soft monotone voice, hoarse, harsh or breathy voice quality, monotone and imprecise articulation. What I wanna do now is play a video of some voices of people with Parkinson's. There's no, uh, or actually it's audio only, there is no video. And as I play this, I want you to sort of listen to how these voices sound. And if you'd like, maybe even type into the chat 
some perceptual characteristics you hear. Do you hear a soft voice? Do you hear different things in their speech? Now, what I've included are speakers of different languages because Parkinson's affects the motor system, which means if you speak English or Czech or Spanish, those are the three languages I'll play for you here, or other languages, um, the motor and sensory symptoms can affect you the same. So we'll just take a listen to these speakers and hear different things in their voice and speech qualities. Well, at, at the time I was diagnosed, I had already had problems with my voice. Did you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes, very definitely because it's embarrassing and it's a strain to talk with people and make sure that they hear me. It's an effort. Když člověk poprvé vsadí do země sazeničku, chodí se na ní dívat třikrát denně. Tak co, povyrosla už nebo ne? Ta jde, naklání se nad ní, přitlačí trochu půdu u jejich kořínků, načechrávají lísky a vůbec ji obtěžuje různým konáním, které považuje za užitečnou péči. Když se sazenička přesto ujme a roste jako z vody, to člověk žasne nad tímto divem přírody. Okay, so um, yes, I'm seeing lots of proper or accurate descriptions of voice that you're typing in. You've got softness, some hoarseness, um, gravelly. So the last speaker, the Spanish speaker, had a more rough kind of gravelly quality to it, some breathiness, the the articulation. And I think even if you don't know the language, you could perceive that the articulation was not cl as clear and precise. And so these are all, again, very common changes that obviously can occur in a degree of severity um, with people with Parkinson disease. Now, many years ago, when we started our work, one of the questions was, well, uh, is the soft voice in Parkinson's really specific to Parkinson's or you know, is it just a part of aging? Because we know that aging, as we age, our voices can get softer. So we did a study, Dr. Ramig and myself, that we looked at different tasks. So down here you see the exercises they did on ah, uh, reading a standard passage, conversation and describing picture. And here we have decibels of sound pressure level, so the, which is an acoustic measure related to vocal loudness. So the higher up, the louder the voice. In yellow, we had our participants with Parkinson's disease. In blue, we had people aging, matched for age and gender, but did not have Parkinson's disease. And what we were able to document was that across all of these speaking tasks, indeed, people with Parkinson's were statistically significantly softer than those individuals matched for age and sex who did not have Parkinson's disease. So this was important to be able to say, yes, it's more than just aging that we see changes in voice. Now, going back to that question, does that matter? Well, in that same study and those same individuals, we had them rate variables related to communication. So things like, do you feel like you're understood by others? Do you participate in conversations or start conversations? And what we saw for many of these variables is that the people with Parkinson's disease rated themselves lower. So they didn't feel as understood. They were less likely to participate or to start conversations. So that means it's matter. Even if you think, oh, maybe my voice got a little soft, not much has changed it may be subtle changes. And we want you to keep participating and starting conversations and staying engaged. 
So the mechanism of that soft voice from a motor perspective really happens at the level of your vocal folds or in late term vocal cords. And what we find in Parkinson's disease is that those vocal folds don't close all the way. And we get what, what's called vocal fold bowing. So there's this gap that happens. And part of that not complete closure underlies the softer voice, hoarseness, breathiness that you can hear. So what I'm gonna play for you now is a videotape of somebody's vocal folds. I'll go ahead and play, I really wanna show you what they look like pre-treatment, but I'll go ahead and play the post-treatment so you can see that we can affect change in this situation with exercises. So what you'll see is a videotape, and this is done um, through endoscopy, and you'll see the vocal folds vibrating. And I'll point out the gap in terms of they don't close all the way. So here are the vocal folds. Okay, again. And you can see if I pause right here, these white strips right here are the vocal folds. And when he opens up, that's your um, the trachea going to your lungs. And in a typical voice, there would be no space right here. There would be no gap. They would close all the way. So this concept of bowed vocal folds that we often see in people with Parkinson's is one of the reasons the voice gets soft. And I'll go ahead and let this video play. Good, now try a loud one. And this is pre-treatment. And when he said get loud, that it got a little better, but it still does not close all the way. Nice loud one now. Now you can see after treatment, it goes all the way to white. And that means the vocal folds are closing all the way, which gives a better acoustic signal. Typically, maybe a louder voice, maybe better voice quality. Okay, so a little more data on the motor symptoms. In this particular study, going beyond recording loudness, which we would call acoustic measures, visualizing the vocal folds, which would be a perceptual physiological measure. In this study, they actually put little hook wires into the thyroid arytenoid muscle, which is one of the muscles that help close the vocal folds. And they measured the amount of activity in that muscle during a range of speaking tasks, again, from doing an ah uh, or an e, um, a sentence repetition, a monologue, reading, and just breathing. And they had three groups of subjects. They had young adults, they had aging adults who did not have Parkinson's disease, and they had individuals with Parkinson's disease in the yellow. And what they found across every single speaking task or even just at rest breathing, there was less activity measured in microvolts in that thyroid arytenoid muscle, one of those uh, muscles in your vocal folds in people with Parkinson's disease. And in fact, it goes down. Young had the greatest amount of activity followed by aged, followed by people with Parkinson's disease. So these are some of the underlying motor changes that can contribute to those perceptual changes that we hear in voice and speech and Parkinson's disease. And don't worry, there's things we can do to make it better, and which I'll get to at the end, but I just wanna kind of give you the full description of the origins of speech disorder. 
Okay, now let's talk about the non-motor disorder. And I'm gonna start with the sensory processing deficits. So the reduced amplitude of movement that we see in people with Parkinson's disease, as it may relate to speech and voice, may be perpetuated by abnormally processed sensory feedback. And the evidence for this is that it's centrally driven, that in our brain, something is not processing correctly, which kind of makes the speech disorder a little bit resistant to improvement. So what we see is that many people with Parkinson's disease, even if they, they are aware that their voice has gotten soft, they may not be aware how soft it's got. They may not, because there's not that awareness, there may be lack of self-correction. And we have this very persistent feeling of being loud enough when you're talking, but you're too soft, and feelings of being too loud when others perceive that as normal loudness. So let's look at that in more detail. On the left here, we have our person with Parkinson's. They're talking at what they perceive as normal loudness. But for some reason, the listeners are having difficulty hearing and understanding them. Um, that can be frustrating. You may have had the experience with people in your life where you, I think you need to get your hearing checked. My voice sounds fine. It's your hearing. It's too loud in this room. Very common. Then when we get somebody with Parkinson's disease, maybe to talk louder, where they're going to perceive, wow, this is too loud. I can't possibly talk like that. But to the listener, they're saying, yep, that's great. Now I can hear and understand you. So what is that that's making that happen? Well, before I get to that, I forgot I have another video. Um, in this video, my colleague you see here, Angela Halpern, is interviewing three of our wonderful um, friends with Parkinson's disease, Margie, Gary, and Leon. And each of these individuals have been through speech treatment, LSBT Loud, but she's asking them about their perspectives of their voice and of their speech before after they were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but before they had gone through speech treatment. So we'll take a look at this video now. Can you tell us when did you first notice changes in your voice and speech? Uh, notices with my speech, I think uh, initially when I was diagnosed in 2013, I had mentioned to my uh, neurologist that no one had really made a comment about my speech. It's just that sometimes when I would be with a group of people and make a comment, I wasn't getting response um, and wasn't things weren't being addressed to whatever comment I had made. And I wondered if people had heard me or if I had been clear. So that was more my concern with my speech initially. That what I actually sometimes would feel ignored because no one had responded to what I had commented. And uh, it makes you feel uh, unimportant, I guess. I just felt kind of like, what's going on here? Why isn't I, why, why am I not getting the response or any response? Were you the first one to notice it or were other people commenting on it? Well, I can tell you, Angela, I hadn't a clue. Um, I, I thought I was sounding great. Uh, as far as I was concerned, I was, you know, not dealing with Parkinson's uh, that had been kind of diagnosed for me back in 2009. I just buried my head in the sand when I heard that because I, I just was not expecting it. I was 44 years old at the time. And I just decided I'd plow ahead and keep going. But um, as I've mentioned before, my wife is a speech and language therapist. And she said to me two things in the first five years of my diagnosis. She said, you need to deal with this and you need to speak up. And I said, well, the deal with thing, you know, I'll, I'll take care of that. But what do you mean speak up? What's the problem? Your voice is getting softer. And I said, no, it's not. And she said, yes, it is. And of course, my wife is always right anyway. So, I mean, that was good to that saying. But, um, and uh, the first conversation I had with uh, a speech and language therapist, other than my wife, um, regarding my voice, um, we just sat, down at a table and, and she put a voice level meter between us 
and we talked for about 10 minutes and she wrote down the scores as she saw them uh, coming up through the, the voice level meter and at the end of the conversation she showed me my scores and they were around 48, 49, 50 dB and I thought that's, that's pretty good and she showed me her scores and they were kind of 89, 90, 91 and she wasn't shouting at me and I thought hmm that's a difference you know so that was the, the first time I find myself being asked again and again what I was saying. So I, it's, it's just, it's just like, like when you sit down and you're kind of watching television and, and uh, you, you assume that they heard you, but you really have to speak up because the TV, the other noise, thing like that, or you're going, so I noticed that I was being asked to repeat myself. And that's how I figured out I really had to work at it. And, and not only just work at it, is to think about it. Okay, so those were some really, um, I think, powerful insights from people with Parkinson's who've now learned a new way of talking, but beforehand, you know, what it felt like. And I think Margie's comments are very common that she may have not noticed her voice has gotten soft, but suddenly people are ignoring her. And I think that comment of feeling unimportant is, you know, a valid one that sometimes people feel. And maybe they don't quite know why, but it could be related to communication. And of course, I love Gary's explanation of, first of all, his wife's a speech therapist telling him, but then when he went to the speech therapist and really documenting those numbers and kind of showing him, yeah, look, your voice is probably a lot softer than you think it is. So what we know so far, it doesn't seem to be um, a, a significant problem with what we would call the, the peripheral auditory mechanism. That is this phenomenon happens in people with normal hearing loss. It happens in people with no hearing loss, young onset Parkinson disease. And if we tape record your voice and play it back to you, people can hear the difference. They can be, sometimes they're shocked. Oh my gosh, that's what I sound like. I had no idea. So that the incoming signal um, in general appears to be intact. So in contrast, it seems to be something happening with what we call autophonic perception of loudness. And autophonic means how I'm perceiving my voice as I'm talking. And so there seems to be some evidence that there's some kind of sensory motor integration deficit during speech in people with Parkinson's. And this evidence comes from what we call perturbation studies. And that is we study how people respond to changes or perturbations in pitch, loudness, and vowel formats. And people with Parkinson's respond differently than those without. Estimation studies, and I'll show you one of those in just a moment, and actually some neural studies as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think, I think this study really kind of highlights the point. So in this particular study, people with Parkinson disease and those without were asked to do what we call a magnitude production task. So they had a series of sentences and they were asked, for example, read it at what you perceive is your normal loudness. Now read that twice as loud, read that half as loud. So they would go through this process of reading at these different self-perceived loudness levels. So at the self-perceived loudness, and these are again decibels of sound pressure level, these numbers. So the higher the number, the louder the voice. And people with Parkinson's were softer at their self-perceived normal loudness, up to three decibels. And decibels, it's a logarithmic scale, so you would hear that difference. It is a, a perceptible difference. And what I find is fascinating, now they said, okay, talk twice as loud. 
And so you see the people with Parkinson's at 68, uh, without Parkinson's up to 73 decibels. But what you see here is that people with Parkinson's disease had to have the perception that they're talking twice as loud to be at the same loudness level of those without Parkinson's disease. So this really is good behavioral evidence that yes, you feel too loud when listeners are perceiving your voice as within normal limits. Why is that happening? You know, I, I don't know that we have the, the exact answer, but Arnold and colleagues um, said that this dysfunctional self-monitoring of speech intensity is a part of the pathophysiological component leading to voice symptoms. Because if people with Parkinson's spontaneously detected their hypophonia, which is not the case on the behavioral level, most likely they could correct it. Um, and that might be something, you know, you know your voice was soft, you realize somebody didn't hear you, you self-correct and say it again louder. So what does this mean for treatment? And I think this was really part of a breakthrough discovery early in LSVT Loud with Carolyn Mead Bonatati, who was the first LSVT Loud clinician, and Dr. Lorraine Ramig, they really realized I, I, we have to treat the sensory component. We can't just do the motor exercises. So although the auditory self-monitoring mechanisms may not be fully operational, people with Parkinson's can use feedback given by a therapist to modulate their speech behavior. And this likely involves neuroplasticity and cortical basal loops. Further, under conditions in which speech motor patterns are modified, for example, during speech therapy, the basal ganglia damage may increase the threshold for this reafferent feedback which kind of reduces the overall system gain. And it increases the need for intensive and extensive training. So focusing on the sensory component, doing it in an intensive way will be key components of what makes speech therapy successful or not for people with Parkinson's. So sensory changes under that umbrella of non-motor symptoms really have a profound impact on voice and speech disorders in people with Parkinson disease. And it's essential that we address those for successful speech treatment. Some other non-motor symptoms that can impact communication are changes, and sometimes these might be subtle changes in cognitive function. So for example, slower thinking um, may result in a slower response time to questions. And sometimes people with Parkinson's are frustrated because people just simply don't wait and give them the time to answer or someone in their environment answers for them. And we found if you can just pause wait, count to 10, give somebody time, oftentimes they can come back, answer you, and answer you very correctly. For language, in addition, some of these changes can happen with aging, but there may be delayed word retrieval, some shifting, difficulty shifting communication topics, maybe some difficulty expanding language and initiating topics, and some difficulty with language processing. And when we put those together, kind of that slower processing, maybe increased levels of distractibility, it can lead to loss of train of thought in a conversation or communication situation. And it may make longer conversations a bit more difficult and frustrating, both for the Parkinson, person with Parkinson's and for the listener. And then finally, as with anything that you have to do, uh, exercise, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, 
we know that that depletion of dopamine sometimes has an impact on our mood that a little bit of reduced vigor. I think this is a nice visual, kind of like your battery has run down and it's not, it needs some recharging. And it may be one reason it's easier to kind of slip into a, a softer voice and maybe defaulting to this lower energy level, despite the fact that people have the capacity to have more energy. And also some anxiety and apathy. And these can sometimes become, uh, kind of get stuck in a cycle because communication isn't good. Maybe you're not sure if your voice is going to work that day. You get a little anxiety about communication situations. You start to tend to withdraw a little bit from it. And then the act of not communicating is not exercising that system and it can feed itself in kind of a negative loop. So when we look at speech, the origins of speech and voice disorders and communication and people with Parkinson's, it's not simple, it's complex. We have this motor impact. We're not scaling the right amount of force and effort. The sensory impact where we may not perceive that our voice has gotten softer. There's a cognitive impact, maybe a little bit slower thinking in terms of communication, and then this emotional impact that can occur as well. So it's, it's no wonder uh, improving communication has not always been effective and it's not always been easy for people with Parkinson's. We also know that Typical medical treatments, while they may improve limb motor systems, they do not significantly improve speech swallowing and communication. That can include pharmacological treatments and it can include neurosurgical interventions. So that really leaves us with behavioral or exercise-based speech treatments. When Dr. Lorraine Ramig began her work in developing what is now known today as LSVT Loud or Lee Silverman voice treatment, this was back in the late 80s. And really at that time, there was no effective speech and voice treatments for Parkinson's. And, and in fact, this quote, I can't even believe this quote was out there, but it was suggested voice treatment for disorders that are degenerative is controversial since there is no expectation for recovery or that any improvement to secondary to speech language intervention will be maintained in the long term. Well, I'm happy to say we have come a long way, baby. And that certainly is not the case at all. In our field of speech language pathology, there is so much that we can do to make a difference and improve communication. Our role as speech language pathologist is to assess and treat speech, swallowing, and cognitive communication disorders. I believe two weeks ago, my colleague Heather Hodges gave a nice talk on swallowing. Next week, Beth will give a little bit more in speech treatment, but I wanna give you a little taste of it today. One thing to consider is to make sure that the treatments you seek out from an, a speech language pathologist are Parkinson's specific. And speech therapists can get very Parkinson's specific training. Um, through programs, for example, from the Parkinson Foundation, they do allied team training where they take rehab professionals and make sure they know specific training to Parkinson disease. Our types of training programs for LSVT really give them very Parkinson specific voice, speech, cognitive linguistic strategies. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that they're evidence based and there are plenty speech and swallowing treatments out there now for Parkinson disease that do have very solid evidence. LSVT Loud, which is what I will talk about today, is considered really the gold standard in that evidence-based category. We have over 30 years of scientific research. 
documenting effectiveness through things like randomized controlled trials, as well as a lot of studies looking at the mechanism of treatment-related change so we can better understand the origins of speech disorders in people with Parkinson's disease and continue to improve the outcomes that we can get through our speech treatment protocols. And speech treatment isn't just for late stage referrals. We say upon diagnosis, get connected with the speech pathologist. We want to start early, but it's also probably never too late. So we'd like to see you across the span of, of your lifetime with Parkinson's disease until we can get that cure and put this all away. So let me just give you a little bit about LSVT Lab. The key concepts incorporate principles that we know are important to drive activity-dependent neuroplasticity or changes in the brain. And treatment is really designed in a way to challenge you, to challenge that impaired system. The target is vocal loudness. So if you're scaled down and soft, we use loudness as a key to drive amplitude and override that hypokinesia. The mode of delivery, intensive and high effort. And we have to address those sensory, cueing, neuropsychological changes that I talked about in order to facilitate generalization. And that is you using the voice you work on in the treatment room out in the real world. So let's look at that target in a little more detail. Before therapy, individuals have a voice that's too soft. And we use one simple cue, speak loud, to drive effort to increase amplitude. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind here is that we are training healthy vocal loudness. That's why you need a speech language pathologist. If you've got hoarseness, roughness, breathiness, sometimes if you just try to get loud, you can make it worse, okay? So you need somebody who knows the voice, knows treatment, knows how to help you get that louder voice in a very healthy way. And of course, we're always training normal loudness. It, it would do no good for to teach you to talk too loud. Although you're going to feel like it's too loud when we just get you to normal loudness. The exciting thing as well is with that one cue of loud, you will do many things. You will take a deeper breath. You'll get louder. You'll open your voice uh, mouth more. And we've documented this through research improvements in all kinds of things like respiration, articulation, facial expression, in addition to vocal loudness. But you have one thing to think about, think loud. As I mentioned, the mode of delivery is intensive and high effort so that we have four consecutive days a week for four consecutive weeks. You get 16 sessions in one month's time they're one hour sessions and it's individual, not group therapy. You have daily homework practice, daily care, uh, um, carryover exercises, all 30 days of that month. And it's delivered by people who've been specifically trained to know how to deliver this treatment. Now, at first glance, you may go, wow, that's really intensive. I would never have the time for that. It's 16 hours. It's less than one day, 24 hours of your life. And so we work with you in terms of scheduling to say, okay, maybe you can't start now because you've got some trips planned or things like that, but let's figure out when we can schedule this in. Take that one month, you deserve it, and it will have a profound positive impact on communication. And then calibration is the way we address that sensory problem. So we're going to help you recognize that even though it feels too loud for you, what people are perceiving is normal limits, 
within normal limits. And we're gonna use lots of meaningful, natural, naturalistic um, activities in our treatment sessions. This is just a breakdown of what a treatment session will look like. And if you attend the, the next uh, webinar on speech treatment, we'll go into this in more detail. But we kind of have these core voice exercises, things like ah, uh, that rescale your loudness, reset your loudness. And then we really spend the second half of the session training that systematically into functional speech and communication for you. So we have the treatment exercises, but our goal is that you have a louder voice in your real life, in the world, world and conversation. So exercises are just a tool to facilitate that improvement. It's not the goal of therapy. And it really is why it's very difficult if you think, oh, I'll just do some awes at home on my own. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but you need the skill of the speech therapy professional to really take that systematically and train it into functional communication, as well as re-learning uh, this new internal cue for what normal loudness sounds like. And it's fun. As part of treatment, your speech therapist is going to go above and beyond and out of their way to make sure we're addressing goals that are important to you. It might be you need to maintain your voice for teaching or lecturing or any other job responsibilities. Maybe it's so that you can read and talk and communicate with your grandchildren, being understood on the telephone, conversing with spouse or family or your support network without having to repeat all the time. So whatever is most important to you, that's what we are going to do in our speech treatment sessions. So let's take a look at a video of a gentleman before and then immediately after LSVT Loud. When did you first notice a change in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Well, probably not too long after that because I, I was doing singing. Mm -hmm. I sang with a company here in town. And my, my voice has never, it had gotten really pretty, pretty weak, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you noticed a change in your singing voice? Yeah. I noticed it didn't have the, the oomph. Okay. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Uh, it's hard to say, and sometimes more because I have to repeat it many times. Right. right. Have you noticed changes in your speech or your voice following the treatment? Very much so, in both. Okay. Tell me what you've noticed. I've noticed that when I concentrate on having a loud voice, I can be understood and I can project my voice so that people can understand me. Great. I find that I hadn't been thinking about a loud voice because I thought my voice was quite adequate. And it clearly is not. And therefore, I think it's uh, representative of the fact that it, it works. Good. Um, has anyone commented to you that it's easier to understand you now? Well, other than the know what <laughs> questions, uh, I notice in many other ways people respond to what I say. They actually want to listen to what I have to say because they can hear it and understand it. And then they can judge whether they like it or not. But at least they listen. Okay, so I want to just share a little tiny bit of evidence and then we'll have some time for questions. So as I mentioned, we do have evidence that has been um, established over the past 30 years from behavioral evidence. Our primary outcome variable in our randomized controlled trials has been vocal loudness measured in the short and long term out to two years. And we've documented this impact positively on things like intelligibility, facial expression, intonation. 
But what's exciting and very interesting related to the sensory processing challenges are some of the neural changes that we've seen. So we've had two published PET imaging studies um, over time. We've had one fMRI study that came out of a group in Germany. And we have one new PET imaging study looking at two different types of treatment and untreated Parkinson's. And so these studies involve four different groups of people with Parkinson's across two different imaging laboratories. And a, a common result across all of those study has been this right-sided shift of activation in areas of the brain that are involved in what we call prosodic or pitch and loudness uh, monitoring. So it's a neural sort of, um, uh, a hypothesis to be a neural correlate of successful sensory recalibration. So helping people with Parkinson's at the end of treatment know the right amount of effort and loudness for them to use so that people can hear and understand them. So what the research tells us as well is what we do in therapy matters. It's not just activity or speech instruction in general, but specificity of activity matters. Thus far, our research would suggest that the voice, kind of this respiratory laryngeal target is special. And it's been better than having a respiratory only target or an articulatory target. And that voice focus and sensory calibration may address the sensory motor integration deficits that affect that self-perception of normal vocal loudness in people with Parkinson's disease. And so through LSBT Loud, we may be providing this cortically driven enhancement of the speech network that can make positive improvements. So this is a reference, and I know that we've had uh, some information dropped in the chat, um, some links to learn more about our research. And just in summary, 90% of people will have a change in their speech and voice. The motor symptoms of hypokinesia and bradykinesia contribute, but we also have non-motor symptoms we have to consider. Behavioral and neural evidence exist for the sensory motor integration deficits. And clinically that manifests as maybe that lack of awareness of a softer voice and difficulty with automatically scaling normal, healthy vocal loudness. So while the origins of the deficits are still not fully understood, it does seem to be something central and the implications for treatment then are that we have to treat those sensory deficits so that the speech treatment outcomes walk out the door and last over time. And finally, LSBT Loud is an evidence-based speech treatment that includes that focus on those sensory deficits that affect speech. So in the words of Daniel Webster, if my possessions were taken from me with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication for by it, I would soon regain all the rest. So we know communication is that at the heart of who we are as humans. And my take home message is there is something that can be done. The sooner the better, get on it, but it's never too late to make a positive change. And with that, I believe I will pause and we can open it up to have some questions. Awesome. So we do have a few questions. And since you were just speaking about Daniel Webster seeing the, the power of communication, um, one question is because you talked earlier just about how people may withdraw from social interaction when their speech has occurred, either whether it's slow response or just that it's it's uh, lower volume and they seem to be ignored. Um, after some, and that has such profound psychosocial impacts. So I'm curious, like once someone has completed in your research, are you seeing not only a change in 
you know, their ability to speak louder, but do you get feedback that people actually are re-engaging in social interactions more? And, and how much of that is it making that kind of an impact? Yes, and we've done some um, specific measures. One in the first randomized trial, there was a measure called sickness impact profile. And we saw that the self-perceived impact of Parkinson's on communication improved after treatment. Um, in our most recent trial, the voice handicap index, another similar measure, and we saw positive changes in the perception of voice and communication after treatment. So in some of our measurements, we've seen that, but certainly in anecdotal reports from people, you know, I'm getting back out there, my voice is alive again, I can communicate with confidence, you know, my poker buddies don't ignore me. And there's a lot of pause. In fact, in treatment, what I mentioned briefly, we have daily carryover exercises. Those are daily assignments. Your speech therapist will make you go out, walk out the door, talk with someone in a voice that feels too loud. And it's essential because as funny as that feels to you, as soon as you do that and you get that positive response, it, it starts that motivation. And then you're like, okay, I'll try it again. Okay, I'll try it again. And so it's really an integral part of the speech treatment. And related to that, um, we know that they, people that are experiencing this may not have insight initially that their speech is lower. Um, is there any differences or any um, perception uh, related to people uh, perceiving other speech patterns, like picking up on uh, nonverbal tone of voice or any changes in their um, ability to receive information? There is actually some literature. Um, it's not severe, but that yes, there might be a little bit of a perceptual problem, in fact, in, in picking up communicative cues um, outside of the person themselves. Um, we've not looked at has that changed with speech treatment, but certainly, um, you know, improving your own communication does tend to, it's just you're at a different level of engagement, I think, after going through something like intensive speech treatment. So um, we've had some questions about whether you've had any experience with stuttering as a symptom of Parkinson's. Yes, so there's two different levels and it's interesting. Um, there are some people who maybe have, um, for example, as a child, they actually had kind of what I would call classic disfluency, stuttering-like behavior, and that they will feel like now as an adult, many years later that they hadn't managed, they feel like they have more problems with disfluencies um, with Parkinson disease. Some of that can be, if it's mild, sometimes after something like LSVT loud that focuses on the voice, they feel, you know what, it doesn't bother me anymore or as much. In other cases, it's pretty significant and the disfluency actually um, impairs intelligibility. In that cases, there's a number of things we might do. We might um, do some direct stuttering type disfluency interventions um, that would be separate from the LSVT loud treatment. In some cases also the stuttering becomes what we call festinating. So just like gait can't get started and then once it starts, it can't stop. We'll find that in the speech and it becomes very rapid repetitive. In those cases, sometimes things like pacing can help and the speech therapist might work with you. One example would be an alphabet board. So you'd have just a piece of paper with the letters of the alphabet and you point to the first word that your letter of the first word that are the word that you're saying as a way to kind of slow down and pace. I've had patients who click a pen and use that as sort of a pacing device. Others do something with um, 
uh, something tactile. So the speech therapist can really help to see maybe one of these kind of pacing techniques can help. Finally, there are some devices that offer altered auditory feedback. Um, some of them put masking noise in your ear. The speech vibe is one of those. Some of them, um, the speak easy is another device. And I think Beth will talk more about those in detail next week. Um, but those can sometimes be helpful too. So like I said, there's a lot of different things we can try, a lot of strategies we have to work with you individually to try to figure out what will work best for you um, to help improve your communication. So we had a couple of questions that are similar. So they're asking about, um, this, someone had done LSVT loud about a year ago, having problems still with volume, should they repeat it or seek out uh, another form of therapy? And then another person was like, you know, once you're finished, is it just a one and done? Can you explain uh, uh, the protocol and what should, someone yes. do. And then I'm going to add on one more question because okay. we're so close to being out of time related to this. Once someone has completed, if you're a treating therapist, how will you keep up with main, you know, whether your client has had improvements and they maintain them and they're doing their homework and, and that they can see that carry over. <laughs> Perfect. Great questions. Um, and it, you know, in the research, the way we really did it, because it's a study, we do the, the dosage and then we follow over time without additional treatment. And our data are very strong out to six months. They fall off a little bit, one year, 24 months, that's the longest we followed. But even in that study, people were still above their baseline levels. Now, real world, we say typically to the therapist we train, check in every six months. If someone is more advanced, has DBS or more severe dis speech disorders, we might check in more frequently. But we recommend a six month check in. It could be as simple as a phone call. How's it going? How do you sound? And maybe um, you need to come back in for some tune up sessions. If we're staying with you every six months, you probably would not need all 16 sessions again. You might come in for four days. We kind of get you boosted back up and then send you back out and we'll check back in. The other things we recommend is, first of all, you're going to learn like a daily home exercise program, like 10 minutes a day. And we're going to say, keep doing that. The better you are, at doing those daily exercises, the better you are at maintaining those changes over time. And finally, while LSVT loud is not done in groups, we do have maintenance groups after the individual treatment is over. And that's not uncommon with other speech treatment approaches as well. So we have groups, for example, Loud for Life, so that it's a group of people who've gone through the individual treatment. Now they get together once a week and have, they do some of their daily exercises, but then they have fun, interactive, motivating communication um, uh, uh, activities. We do a lot of them virtual now, go into breakout rooms, um, and it, that's another way to help maintain and improve the voice. And if it's been a couple years since you've had it, you might need the treatment again. And that's okay. That's not a failure. It's just you've had some progressions and changes. And so reconnect with the speech therapist, get an evaluation. And can you do it by Zoom? Because there are people that live in remoter areas that yep. don't have access to an LSVT certified therapist. Yes, telepract. We actually had telepractice before COVID, and we have research studies telepractice uh, that it works as effectively. And so, on our clinician search tool, um, you can actually search for people. It's called eLoud that specifically do. LSVT through telepractice. So absolutely. And I know we're running out of time, like at the top of the hour, but I did have one question that I think is helpful because um, we do have people that have maybe atypical forms of Parkinson's like uh, PSP. Does LSVT loud help someone with PSP? 
yes, it can be helpful. Um, so we would, um, the earlier, the better for sure. Uh, I, that would be one I would say upon diagnosis, start behavioral treatment, speech, physical, and occupational therapy. As we know, medications are not as good or effective for atypical Parkinson's. It's really behavioral interventions that give us our best tools and tips. So it can be helpful. Likely you're going to have more frequent and continuous speech therapy, um, but you, it, it definitely can have a positive impact. Okay, and I can't recall if you mentioned this or too in depth, but does LSVT have carryover impact into swallowing? Got it, yes, and there was a swallowing. If you missed the swallowing mm -hmm. webinar, it's on demand given by Heather Hodges, which was, she's a wonderful um, expert in swallowing. Um, so we say LSVT loud is not swallowing therapy. So if you are having swallowing challenges, we want to do direct interventions, things like expiratory muscle strength training. Your therapist will give you very specific, you know, exercises, perhaps uh, feeding and dietary modifications. That being said, some people who go through LSVT loud, and we do have some pilot data do show some mild improvements in things like um, uh, control of saliva, control of the oral phase of swallowing. So you may get some secondary benefits. We would just say don't use it as swallowing therapy, do direct swallowing interventions first. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cynthia. This has been fantastic. So we have dropped some chat or in the chat, we've dropped some um, links to some resources that Cynthia shared with us. If you want to save your chat, um, you can go back and refer to those. If you go over to where you type your, um, your questions in your chat box, there's three little buttons. If you pop those up, it'll pop up a box and it'll say save chat and it'll save it to your device. Um, this will be available on our YouTube channel um, and actually accessible from our website um, within a day or so, as well as a handout that will uh, go along with us. So we invite you to go back and listen to this again, um, because she offered so much information that sometimes we need to go back and take more notes. Cynthia, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us today and giving us such a, a well-rounded uh, discussion of the speech issues. And I want to invite everyone to uh, do the wave of gratitude as we thank you for joining us and giving us your time today. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everyone have a great rest of your day and Cynthia, you as well. And we will see you again soon. Perfect. Bye.